I love that hymn. I told the first service, I don't think we sung that in my 18 years here. <laughs> it's a hymn that's companion with Max Cap's other hymn, Hymn 24. And this hymn is almost as if unfinished, finished in 24. It's a beautiful hymn, but mostly what it does is orient the spirit in a moment where the singer or the, the speaker is seeking the unification between that spiritual life and the world around him or her. That's in part what I want to talk to you about today. Now, I've long believed that we have supplanted God with the Spirit as a faith. By that, I mean we sideline God and the concept God, probably since the Second World War. I remember when I was an intern in St. Louis, one of my members of my church told me that the day he walked into a concentration camp in Poland as a, as a uh, American soldier liberating the camp, God died for him. I think that happened in the middle of the 20th century for many. And we spent the rest of that century turning over God and replacing it with all sorts of things from the abstract to con concepts that were beyond naming to drugs to atheism. And in the 21st century, we looked for an alternative, I think, to fill that void as Unitarians. We were pretty sure it wasn't going to be Jesus. So somehow, I believe, we turned toward the Spirit. Our hymns tell that story. In this hymnal and in the hymns we sing on the screens occasionally, if you look carefully, they're about gathering the Spirit, not knowing where we're going, bringing the Spirit to the sea, committing the Spirit to an investigation of something beyond ourselves. Now, committing the Spirit for Unitarians is a curious thing because we have long committed to reason as a foundation of our faith. In the 18th century, we called the Spirit, or connecting with the Spirit, enthusiasm. It was something to be avoided at all costs. <laughs> In those years, the debates raged over the Great Awakening. Thousands of people would gather in public places to be moved by Jonathan Edwards' spirit and told they were sinners in the hands of an angry God. And the Unitarian ministers said that if you lost your head in worship, you weren't worshiping at all. Our feet were firmly planted with God, not the spirit. But all that seems to have changed. And I actually think probably for the better. But honoring the Spirit comes with a certain responsibility, a certain investigation that we have to think about. I want you to hear the words of my Unitarian colleague, Reverend Sandra Fees, who wrote this poem, Another Direction. She writes this. She writes, the moment comes when a choice arises, a holy moment. A decision must be made. Do I remain as I am, or do I risk inching, leaping, flowing in another direction? Do I risk what I think I already know and already am? Do I forfeit my security for the possibility that a simple shift may alter the course of my life, even perhaps the life of another? I long to let go of all that restrains me so that I might pursue the impossible and surmount the insurmountable, to let go of anger, to let go of the need to be in control, to forgive a friend, to forgive myself, to refuse what thwarts my spirit, to refuse what limits my mind, to surrender to what will come, to surrender to this holy moment that I have let slip away for too long. In a sense, she's describing Unitarian Universalism and our desire to move closer to the world of the Spirit, but resist it all the same. Because it means 
that we have to let go of certain ideas about who we are. There may be good reason to resist the spirit. The spirit is unpredictable and it's hard to discern. And it requires a surrender to the holy moment that not all of us are prepared to make. I'm not sure any of us in this congregation today are all that good at surrendering to the Holy Spirit, myself included. When I think of the Spirit, I think of two things that come to mind. The first was an experience I had as a seminarian at San Francisco General Hospital. I was working with HIV and AIDS patients as a chaplain. I remember one day I knocked on the door of Harold, who was a homeless man who had HIV. And I went in and I saw him there and there was a large woman dressed as a civilian rubbing oil all over Harold. He looked kind of pleased about it, <laughs> but also a little terrified. And I said to her, what are you doing? And she replied, I'm the Holy Spirit anointing this man with oil. To which I replied, well, the Holy Spirit needs to leave the hospital and not spread germs all over Harold. She vanished. You see, the spirit is unpredictable. <laughs> the second is it might require a lot of us. I think of the, the book and then the movie called Yes Man, written by Danny Wallace, a British guy who decided after meeting a guru-like character on a bus in London, who said to him, you should say yes more that he would take on the experiment of saying yes to anything anybody asked of him for a month. You could imagine how this went. <laughs> he ended up in places he didn't expect doing things he didn't know he would be doing. And don't tell my wife, but I've committed to say yes to every request that she has during this five or six weeks of her cancer treatments. Note to spouses and partners, we probably should practice more of this for our loved ones before cancer. But the problem with the spirit, what moves us can and might not be in our best interest. And so I'm not recommending that you follow every whim. A bit of reason helps steer the ship, but I am suggesting that a bit more spirit can help grow our lives. While we, particularly in this church, myself included, recoil from the idea, I want to suggest that we talk about surrender. Now, I'm guessing no one in this room, except those in recovery programs and our Muslim friends, are that good at surrender in here. Surrender is a kind of trust fall into the universe. It means relinquishing a self-centeredness to a universal will. It means giving up the kind of power that pits us against the world. It means opening up to wisdom of others without agreeing with everything that another has, but approaching another's wisdom in a way that is open to hearing what they have to say. It's a listening to the will of the God universe. It is spending time in suspended discernment before decision making. It is feeling our way into what is true. It is finding comfort in placing our lives in the massive river of life and time without fear. And if we can do those things, if we can even hint at doing those things, I think we can feel a free and authentic spiritual life emerging from us. But it requires frameworks. And that's where recovery and Islam have good ideas for us. In recovery, the framework is very clear. There's 12 things you have to go through. But at the center of it is this serenity prayer. You have heard it many times. Some here told me this morning that they get on their knees every morning 
and say this prayer, God grant me the courage to change the things I can, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the wisdom to know the difference. Wise counsel. There are certainly things we can and should change with courage. Abusive relationships, life work balance that is off kilter, bad habits, social injustices. But there are also things that no amount of action on our part will change, making, making someone love you, making someone stay, bringing back a loved one from the dead, wishing away a diagnosis. To know when to surrender to these situations and when to act is what the serenity prayer is asking us to do. It requires a kind of fearless living, knowing when action and inaction are the right course. And to do that takes some spiritual centering. And at the center of spiritual centering is letting go and surrender. Now, a colleague of mine pointed out to me that there was an episode in Star Trek Voyager that outlines this perfectly. <laughs> I found the, the clip, and it was from this clip in the episode called Twisted. Those of you Trekkies out there, I know you'll go want to look at this. But it's a metaphor for all of what I'm talking about, and this is the scenario. The, cr the crew is on this ship, and they've encountered a kind of distortion the doors are acting weird. The captain is incapacitated. The holodeck is all messed up. Think life. <laughs> They're prepared for the distortion to crush the ship. Systems are shutting down. The crew is arguing, cries out that they've tried everything. And then the calm Vulcan Tuvok has a suggestion. Do nothing. Are you crazy, they say? <laughs> we can't do nothing. So they run around and rush around and they try to deal with this mysterious distortion and they come back to Tuvac who says, when every logical course of action is exhausted, the only option that remains is inaction. Tuvac to me is like Jesus in that scene in the Bible when the disciples are on the boat and there's a storm all around them and the disciples are rushing around trying to figure out what to do and he's asleep on the bow. Do nothing. Inaction is sometimes the answer. Surrender to the moment, to something greater than ourselves. But oftentimes that requires a framework. Now, all faiths have this, no more centrally than Islam. Islam literally means to surrender. And being a Muslim literally means the one who has surrendered. Having surrendered himself or herself to God or resigned her will to God's will in such a way that she experiences the well-being of God's peace. That's what it means. So there's a comfort in giving up control. For a Muslim, surrender is to God, which invites consideration of relationship between faith and good works, the awareness of power versus a sense of human responsibility, and the relationship of theology and the practice of faith hinged on obedience and the five pillars that you can go look up on your own. Obedience is part of surrender. Now, I'm guessing that obedience is not a trait of Unitarian Universalism. <laughs> if I asked how many people in here self-identify as incredibly obedient, I think we'd get very few hands. What I am not suggesting is surrender means submission or humiliation or degradation or abasement. I'm not talking about soldiers on their knees 
hands behind their back, the control of women in bad marriages or by the courts, verbal denunciation of anyone on the margins, or things that lead to humiliation, anger, and powerlessness. Free surrender is not a game of power, but a spiritual release of control. Like Sam Keen in our reading, who describes his fall from the trapeze, that twist and turn that lands us on our back safely in the net requires both a framework and an ability to fall gracefully, to acknowledge what is, and in midair to release one's body, one's soul, one's heart. The trapeze is life. The grasping, the bar is taking on anything new, new, and the fall is knowing that it doesn't ever go the way we expect. We all know something about relinquishing power. In positive sexual encounter, there's a rush of love and joy. That's surrender. Leaving our reason behind and feeling one with nature or a place or a moment, that is surrender. To surrender is to fall, but it also needs a framework. The personal and the faithful intersect, and it's harder to find it when we want to reason our way through everything. So I created five pillars for Unitarian Universalist surrender. <laughs> Things to practice that I will publish for you this week if you don't take the notes now, but based on my experience of Islam and my friends at the Richardson Mosque, I thought, what is surrender for a Unitarian Universalist? I think it's five things. I think one, it's giving up fighting over what God is or isn't and stopping all defense of atheism or theism and letting God be God. And two, yielding to trust. Here the 12-step program might help us. Admitting that we are powerless over certain things in our lives deciding to turn over our will to something greater than ourselves. And three, committing to, do, to doing good on a regular basis, not just being good, but daily and weekly doing something good for someone else. And four, practicing letting go of fear, finding joy in life. And five, sharing our faith with others. I think if we practice these things, we get closer to a surrender to a life of faith. We give up the fights over what we believe and don't believe. We find deeper senses of trust. We commit to doing good for others, moving our self-centeredness outward to others in the world, letting go of fear finding joy, and sharing our faith with others. Living lives of authenticity means, to some extent, letting life unfold without control, finding ways to listen to the universe beyond ourselves, freeing our lives to purpose and intent without losing the center of who we are. I think all those things are core to being Unitarian Universalist today. The trapeze artist falls from the bar for a new beginning because he has to go back up the ladder. And the addict, addict doesn't forget who she is but gives up control over the self to something larger for new beginning. And the spiritual pilgrim, the one who comes to church on Sunday morning to hear a preacher try to make sense of surrender, doesn't fight who he is, but listens deeply and seeks wisdom of spirit. That's what we're up to. And that's what I hope you're up to. It doesn't mean you lose yourself. 
as the band Cheap Trick left us with a, a famous line, surrender but don't give yourself away. Maybe the balance of authenticity is in that. Sometimes we might do well to seek the Spirit, to let go of anger, to let go of the need to be in control, to forgive a friend, to forgive ourselves, to refuse what thwarts our spirit, to refuse what limits our minds, to surrender to what will come, to surrender to this holy moment that we have let slip away for too long, says my colleague. That's Unitarian Universalism that seeks the world of the spirit that moves us here and now. So let us sing a song now. It's called, Do When the Spirit Says Do, as a way of practicing what I'm talking about right now. 